Well, it's been a while. It has been a while. Hello, one and all, and welcome to Behind the Glass, the podcast which aims to take you behind the scenes of the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass, as well as the automotive and social media worlds. I mean, this was going strong at the beginning of the year, wasn't it? Um, for those of you, for your, well, those of you who are listening to the podcast for the very first time, welcome. Uh, I set up Behind the Glass about a year and a half ago now, whilst I was still in the UK, um, as a way to just share more information about what I did and talk to people in a sort of different way than I do in my main YouTube videos. Uh, stock up a sort of a, a good um, amount of podcast uh, at some point last year. I think we were sort of doing weekly episodes. And then that all went to hell uh, when I started planning Drive the World. I was so absolutely overwhelmed with the amount of work that needed to go into planning Drive the World that I just simply forgot to record episodes of Behind the Glass. Uh, I was determined to bring it back this year, make it part of the trip. And I started off strong, I think, in Australia, recording three, I think, in total uh, episodes that I thought were great. Actually, even one in New Zealand. Um, but again, as time moved on and as the uh, amount of energy required into completing Drive the World each day increased, um, my ability to record episodes of the podcast decreased. And we come to this situation where I haven't really uploaded one of these podcasts for I don't know how long. But look, let's not uh, make excuses. I am back. Uh, Behind the Glass is back. Uh, and once again, <laughs> I am determined to make this a regular feature. Um, but no promises, because obviously I've just been absolutely useless in the past. But hey, we all live and learn. I think this is third time lucky. I think this is third time lucky. Um, I've been trying to assess how, how can I bring Behind the Glass back in a realistically, uh, in a realistic way. Because if I'm honest, one of the hardest parts about Behind the Glass on the Road is finding people to speak to, interviewees. Um, and that was always sort of one element of the podcast, was to chat to people, uh, not only in the UK, but as I moved around, interesting people who could provide insights into their worlds of social media or cars or race cars, whatever it might be. Um, but for sure, sort of arranging those hasn't been that easy. But also, I think you might underestimate the actual time and effort that goes into recording, editing, planning podcast episodes. It seems super easy. It seems like just sit down and have a chat and off you go. But it's a bit more than that. But I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to complain. Um, but the way that I thought is a sort of realistic way for me to keep bashing out episodes is this. Sitting down to talk with you guys, hopefully every week, from my hotel room to kind of update you with stories from the road. Uh, Vicky, my girlfriend, again, if you haven't been watching The Drive of the World, uh, this entire year, Vicky, my girlfriend, is with me, and she's taking on a producer role uh, for Behind the Glass. So, Vicky, you can say hi. Hi, everyone. Um, Thanks for the permission. There we go. She's, uh, she's still not going to be appearing on camera. This is a decision we made a long time ago that uh, Vicky's not a YouTuber. She's not looking to become a YouTuber. And whilst she is part of this adventure and journey, she has her own life and her own life that we want to protect and that she wants to continue. Uh, and it just didn't really make any sense. There was no reason for her to be part of the videos. Yeah. But there's no, there's no point. Otherwise, you know, otherwise the the channel turns into a girlfriend boyfriend channel and it's not what it is. It's not what it is. It's a car channel. Um, but anyway, she is of course here and she does play a part uh, in the main channel videos as some of you might have seen. And she's going to be playing a part in the podcast as well, helping not only for me to remember what I want to talk about, but also uh, inputting her opinions, uh, controversies they might be as we go along the way. Um, so yes, this is what's going to happen. As I say, right now you join us. I wish I could pronounce where we are. Shafok? I have no idea, but yeah. it's a famous lake, apparently. It's Mexico. a very picturesque lake. And where is it? In Hungary. Thank you. There you go. Vicky, the producer, already being useful. Um, yes, it's in Hungary. Uh, we are here because tomorrow is Cars and Coffee Hungary. If you don't know, Cars and Coffee are an official... Well, it's the official Cars and Coffee. I think all over the world people have coffee and car events. Um, but this is the one and only true Cars and Coffee, uh, run by a wonderful Italian man called Francesco. Uh, I missed the actual Italian Cars and Coffee, which happened earlier this year. Seb Delaney and Paul Wallace went, I think. Um, but I'm going to be attending tomorrow the Hungarian Cars and Coffee. I've never been to, well, actually, I have been to Hungary. Have you? Yeah, I came for the McLaren 600 LT launch in Buda, Budapest. That's different. Where, where did you drive? Did you drive around? The no, in, but yeah, no, just, just, no, no, just Budapest. 
I went to Budapest, I drove uh, at the racetrack and then I flew home. Okay. So, so I haven't explored. This is a different experience. This is a different rural experience. Hungary right now. As we saw by our three hour drive off the motorway on ex extremely bumpy roads for a while <laughs> and storms. But we've now but arrived. Because you missed, that's because you missed the exit that you were supposed to take. This is where you're now so, overstepping your mark as a producer. So, <laughs> that's not important information. So yeah, Waze probably took us the wrong route. Well, yeah. not ideal. Yeah, not, not ideal route. Um, yeah, but I would agree, the, the, the roads were pretty dodgy. Roads were pretty dodgy, but we've now arrived at this absolutely stunning lake and we are in the Hotel Wella Marin. Well in, uh, which has its own bowling alley, which I love. Um, and this it also is also has a dentist office. Yeah, a bit confusing that, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of a dentist clinic slash hotel, it's which is fine. Ticking a lot of boxes, ticking a lot of boxes. Um, but anyway, my plan is today to rattle through uh, or, or to look back on a few recent adventures and recent memories from Drive the World. I realise that there has been a big gap, as I mentioned, between episodes, but we're starting afresh from here and I want to talk about the sort of most recent activities. So just to let you know what we're going to be getting into, uh, it's going to be a recap of my Geneva test drives, because if you've seen the videos, on Seen Through Glass, the main channel, uh, you'll know that I got behind the wheel of a Pagani Huayra, yes, I'm saying that out loud, that actually happened, uh, as well as an F12 TDF, yes, a Ferrari F12 TDF. But one video you might not have seen yet, well, you actually haven't because I haven't posted it anywhere, uh, is I also got behind the wheel of a McLaren 675LT for the first time. So more on that to come very shortly. Uh, we also stayed at the incredible Four Seasons Hotel in Geneva, an insane experience that we will come back to and talk about in great length because we've now had the, the the luck of staying at well two huge incredible five-star hotels a couple of other incredible five-star hotels but two like world renowned yeah. five-star hotels yeah. um pure luck though not not planned <laughs> not planned i wish we could be staying a lot more so but they've been such great surprises yeah we'll get back onto that uh stuttgart uh i didn't actually make a lot of content in stuttgart because i had a lot of meetings there i uh, went to see amg mercedes uh porsche but we did attend the uh w series first race in hockenheim which was also the launch of the dtm 2019 season and the porsche carrera cup germany uh, or deutschland uh and then finally i want to touch on where next not only in europe but the slightly ominous American leg of Drive the World, which we are now seriously turning our attention towards. So that's what's to come. Uh, hopefully we're going to have about a half an hour ahead of us. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hello, welcome back to my face. Apologies. Oh, there's Vicky's hand. Uh, apologies for the whole animation debacle. Uh, if you've been watching on YouTube, uh, you'll know that at the beginning of the year, I tried to do some sort of animated episodes. That was just an attempt to make it easier for me to produce and release these podcasts um but i saw your feedback it didn't go down well so i, I listened to what you had to say uh, and now you're back with just my face i am going to try and use my phone uh, to show you some photos some sort of behind the scenes photos as we move on but otherwise you've got just this and the background is our lovely hotel room for those of you listening thank you for tuning in make sure you are following or subscribing on whatever platform you're listening to us on hopefully you can find us in most places these days but anyway here we go bishop ash bosh let's get into it so yes, Geneva. Let's look back. It's a few weeks ago now. Is it a few weeks ago? No, about, yes, about a few it weeks. It feels like a few weeks ago. Things turn into a blur real quick. It all becomes a I bit of a blur. I think it was last week. I think it was last week or 10 days ago. Anyway, it was a while ago. Um, and as I mentioned, I had the amazing opportunity to get behind the wheel of a Huayra, Pagani Huayra, and an F12 TDF, but you will not have seen, or you might not have seen, that I got behind the wheel of a McLaren 675LT for the first time. Now, this is a car that has been very well documented on YouTube. Heck, Shmi 150's own two in coupe and spider form. Mr. JWW even owned one for some time. And I think just a lot of journalists and social media influencers, my least favorite word in the world, uh, have spent time and made content with this car. However, I'm not one of those people. Weirdly, my only experience to date has been in the passenger seat of Shmi's Cerule Cerulean? Cerulean Blue 675 LT Coupe. What does Cerulean mean? I don't think anyone knows what Cerulean means, but it is the color that Shmi's Senna is. Right. And did you see his blue coupe is out yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay well we saw him somewhere drive past the not the purple one did you see the blue one? 
No, that was a 570. I don't know if you ever saw the blue one. Maybe not. Well, I... I don't see Shmi very often. No, you don't. Unfortunately, Cruising you don't. Past. Cruising past. Well, anyway, it, it's the colour of choice for him. It's like a light, pale sky blue. Um, and that was my only experience in an LT up to this point. And so the reason that it didn't make it as a main channel video is partly my fault, but also uh, a little bit the actual circumstances. I have to give a huge thanks to the people at Perigo Cars, who are a dealership just outside Geneva, for inviting me down and basically offering me the keys to any car in their dealership. And when I looked at the lineup, the only car that I sort of hadn't really filmed or spent time around was the LT. Whilst they had incredible Porsches and Ferraris, uh, it was the LT that jumped out at me. So let me try and bring up some pictures now on my phone for those of you watching on YouTube. For those of you listening, it was a stunning chicane grey LT. Lots of carbon, nice orange details. Um, and we took it to sort of quite a picturesque road uh, in unbelievably the vineyards around Geneva. I had no idea there were vineyards around Geneva, but there are. Um, and it was a beautifully sunny day, but I had about an hour to film the entire experience or to have the entire experience that included arriving at Perigo, meeting the people, having a tour. Um, and by the time we actually set up with the GoPros on the camera on the car, I had about 25 minutes and I am not one that copes with the pressure of having to review a car instantaneously that well. I'm not a one take kind of guy. As I've said many times before, I didn't get into this game to be a YouTube. Uh, no, I did get into this game to be, a, to be a YouTuber. <laughs> I didn't get the sense to be a journalist or to review cars. It's more about sharing my experiences with cars. And so to have to drive that car for the first time and express all of my emotions and feelings in 20, 25 minutes just didn't sit right with me. I was panicking. I didn't say the things I wanted to say. And the whole situation stressed me out. Um, and so, you know, I have to apologize a little bit to Perigo uh, for not producing that video. Um, but also my own mistake for sort of not realizing that was too little time to, to film the experience. So let me look back now with hindsight, because the whole point I was trying to make with that piece of content was that I think the 675 LT is the McLaren you should buy. I mean, <laughs> we should all buy is if you're in the position to buy, you should buy. Because let's look at McLaren as a general. Uh, a lot of bad things have been said about them on the market or on social media in general, their position on the market, because the cars don't hold value. Uh, however, the LT just, there's something about that car, which I think means that it one day it will have to slowly trickle back up. I think it's a special car that at the moment is being overlooked because at one point they were up at nearly £400,000 on the second-hand market in the UK. Now, you could get a really high-mileage, bad-spec car for under two hundred grand, which means it's under its initial list price. And this is the car that knocked, arguably, the 458 Speciale off the top spot of all-time greatest supercars. Well, not all-time, but modern great supercars. What am I trying to say? Basically, when that car came out, its competitor was the 458 Speciale, a car that was heralded as one of the greatest Ferraris of all time. And a lot of journalists said that the 675 LT was better. But now on the used market, it's half the price of a 458 Speciale. And to me, that doesn't make sense. So I feel like if you're a sort of investor kind of guy, if you want to have a McLaren experience, the LT is the route to go because Arguably, it's better than all the other McLarens. You could say the 720 is faster, the 570 GT is more complete, but if you're spending 200 grand on a supercar, don't you want something a bit visceral and exciting? I think that's what the LT offers. We've lost Vicky a bit now. She's fallen asleep to the side of me. Um, Vicky wasn't there. I wasn't there on the day, was I? Vicky wasn't there on the day, and she's not the biggest McLaren fan. So we lose her. She glazes over a little it's bit. It's better that I don't say anything. It's better that she says nothing. Um, but yeah, it was, as I say, you know, the biggest thing, the, my biggest thing, which I wish I could tell viewers, um, followers of Seen Through Glass, is that things don't always go as planned. You know, especially on Drive the World, uh, some people question, you know, why I haven't filmed X, Y, or Z, why I didn't go to X, Y, or Z locations. And sometimes I try, and sometimes it just doesn't work out. And that is one of those examples where, unfortunately, the video just did not work out. And, uh, I think you all know I'm a big fan of quality over quantity. And rather than just go, screw it, stick the video up, who cares, it's another one on the bed notch. Um, I, I did, or another, another notch on the bed head? 
I don't know this expression. No. It sounds a bit weird. It sounds a bit weird, yeah. Well, anyway. Put a nail in the coffin. There we go. Another, no, that sounds even <laughs> weirder. Um, but but uh, fundamentally, it just wasn't a good enough video in my mind, in my perspective. But still a great opportunity. So, uh, moving on, another thing to touch on in Geneva uh, was our experience at the Four Seasons Hotel. The Hotel de Burgues. The Hotel of Dreams. <laughs> yes, well summarised, producer. Uh, the Hotel of Dreams, indeed. So, how did this come around? Well, you may have seen earlier in the year, uh, we were very kindly invited to stay at the Peninsula Hotel in Hong Kong, an iconic hotel in Asia and across the world, uh, and a good friend of mine put me up there, which was just, well, put us up there, was unbelievable. I, I don't think I've ever stayed in a hotel like that or had an experience like that in a hotel. It was quite sort of... <sighs> quite overwhelming yes. there you go yeah yeah, yeah for sure for can't sure. even get the words stepping out stepping into this massive apartment that we had you know this suite um it was just unbelievable it know? was unbelievable um and from that we got invited to then stay at the four seasons in geneva so I, it's crazy how this world works um i'm not sure how it all came about but i got a message saying look you know the four seasons of geneva want to put you up for your time in geneva to support drive the world which is great because we could never afford to stay at these hotels normally so without the support of these incredibly generous people we wouldn't have these experiences and be able to share them with you so we have to give a big thanks to both the peninsula and the four seasons um but to touch on the four seasons uh sort of mainly here it's hard to summarize why it was so amazing I couldn't summarise it. Vicky can summarise. Okay, let me <laughs> let me turn the microphone towards Vicky. Well, I think the best the best experience about both the peninsula and the Four Seasons was that we felt at home because we had the space. Uh, first of all, of course, it's incredibly luxurious and amazing, but also we had space, which is not something that we get very often on Drive the World, and you know, not having a home or a house. Uh, at the moment, currently for the whole year, it feels nice to actually feel like you're you're back to normal life, even if it is for two days. You know, wash your clothes, um, be welcomed at breakfast. You know, feel super super homely. I think that's the that's the difference that those hotels make. Well, that's I mean because. We are staying in apartments when we're there. I mean, you know, the, these hotels, we always expect to turn up and be in the cupboard underneath the stairs because they're putting us up for free. Um, so, you know, we do kind of think we're going to get the lowest end. But no, they go over the top and spoil us and put us in these apartments. And so, but for me, it's beyond that. It's, it's actually the people. It's the service that make it special because we do stay in some nice hotels. Don't get me wrong. We're definitely not backpacking this year, but we are very, very budget conscious to try and survive this year financially. Um, but, but at the same time, it's, it's that level of service. It's that constant smiley face that we, we will do anything to help, you know, we're weird with our food. I have a lot of stomach issues. So I'm constantly asking for, you know, lactose free milks and gluten free breads, all that the doctors advise me I should be eating. And, you know, that's always a bit frustrating and annoying. But in a hotel like the Peninsula or Four Seasons, they will literally run to get those things for you if they haven't got them in the kitchen, which they always do anyway. So, it was a truly amazing experience. I have to touch on the gifts, the presents at the Four Seasons. Yeah. Because Peninsula spoiled us with experiences. Like there we had the Rolls Royce pickup from the airport. We were offered a helicopter tour, which I turned down because I'm a pussy. You bailed. I you bailed. bailed. We had endless Music. chocolate tasting experiences. In the, anyway, so, so it, but it, Four Seasons, instead of experiences, we just got presents. <laughs> Every time we went back to the room, there were, I mean, I had a, a seen-through glass embroidered pillow, which we've kept, by the way. A lot of you were like, oh, can you keep that pillow case? We kept the whole pillow. Um, we got given... So now when we arrive places, that pillow is at the back of the tea, and people are looking at us like we're mad. Like we're mad, because we do live in that car. But no, it, it, what else did we get? We got a chocolate... Formula yeah, One car. And you got that bell. I got this Where toy. Is it? is it not here? Uh, you could try and hit my suitcase. I'm not sure if it will work. But anyway, it's a little buzzer. You push it and it's a recording of me going, hello, one and all. And then at the end, uh, one of the team from Four Seasons has gone, and welcome to the, Ho the Four Seasons Geneva. I don't think it's in that bag. Vicky's now currently rummaging through okay. 
well, one of the suitcases that we bought in from the car. You'll see it. We'll, we'll bring it on the next. Yeah, episode. on the on the next episode, it will try and make a feature. But no, truly a, an amazing experience. Huge thank you to both of those hotels. Uh, for, off the back of it, we've had a couple of other hotels reach out, and so we're hoping to be able to share some more luxury experiences uh, as we as we move on. But and it's just just to, as a bolt on comment. Uh, I know you say, you know, we're not back, 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 back and we've got a budget for every night and there, there is a big, big schedule around this whole year and, you know, big planning coming when it comes to hotels. Uh, but we've definitely stayed in some really bad hotels. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, that. yeah. <laughs> Let's not forget that. Vicky won't let me forget that, boys and girls. That gets reminded constantly. So it feels really nice to, then you kind of forget about it when, you know, when you get the Four Seasons reach out and you walk in and you're instantly forgetting about all those bad experiences where you've been in rooms with no windows or but space. we haven't slept in the Carrera Tea yet. And that was a genuine possibility at one hey, point. Hey, there's nothing bad about sleeping in the career. Well, I think it's very comfortable. Um, okay, well, I think does that kind of yeah, summarizes no, 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 our, no, our no, Geneva no. experience, right? I think so. So we move on to Stuttgart, which was effectively the next uh, stop. Um, and I want to talk about the W Series because this was really in a sort of amazing motorsport event for me personally to witness. Um, I think you all might remember Jamie Chadwick from a video I filmed with her Oh, I lose track of time. But um, a while ago now where I took a caterham to a go-kart track and raced her around that track. So I was in the caterham, she was in the go-kart. I nearly crushed her about four times, but luckily I didn't. That video blew up. I think it has over 700,000 views now. So hopefully you all saw it. Uh, well, I was literally just looking at my planning for Drive the World. I was thinking, okay, what am I going to be doing in Stuttgart? When I noticed that it was the launch of the DTM series, the 2019 DTM series. Let me try and get this right again. Deutsche Tourenwagen Mastershift. It's essentially, wow. yeah, that was a wow, good, good was effort. Great. Thank you. Uh, one of the most iconic, if not the most iconic touring car series in the world. Actually, that's a bit, that's a bit punch, isn't it? Because BTCC. But anyway, well, yeah, it's very iconic. Um, and it was the 2019 Start of the season, I thought, great. As I looked into it further, I realised that it was also the launch of the W Series, which is the all-female, open-wheel, junior formula series, which I think they hope to help, you know, bring girls into the sport and elevate them up through the other ranks of the sport. At the moment, it's just its own standalone series. There's no sort of, okay, the winner of the championship gets a Williams F1 test drive. Nothing like that. It's just its own standalone series. David Coulthard has been very involved in setting the whole thing up. And Miss Jamie Chadwick is one of the drivers, if not the big name driver of the first season. So I immediately sent her a message and said, Jamie, I'm going to be in Stuttgart. Let's catch up. I want to come and see you and I want to come and support you at W Series. Um, I actually ended up going to the whole race weekend with Porsche because it was also a Carrera Cup Deutschland race weekend. Uh, Carrera Cup, uh, one of the most popular single make racing series in the world when they use 911 GT3 cup cars uh, and German the German series they had a, a race happening at Hockenheim at the same time so Porsche very kindly invited us gave us hospitality which I have to say was much needed because it was freezing cold and pouring with rain it's the coldest we've been throughout this whole year I would agree it's, it's the general. coldest we've been I mean it's with something about the weather I mean okay I don't want to get on a whole like save the world global warming rant but uh, should. I should, and maybe we'll save it for another episode because I'm not sure my automotive listeners are going to really get behind me. Um, but one thing I've definitely noticed is the shifting, not only weather patterns, but just general uh, atmospheric changes in the world as we've moved around. Ladies and gentlemen, it is May. It is coming up to the middle of May and it's freezing cold and it's raining and this is not right. It was so, snowing in Stuttgart. It was snowing in Stuttgart. There we go. Uh, but we were there. And of course, uh, whilst I was there to check out the Carrera Cup and hang out with the Porsche guys, I was also rooting for Jamie Chadwick. And good Lord, she dominated. She dominated. I made an entire main channel video about it. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. She's incredibly sweet. I mean, she's she's adorable, but also like, you know, real determined. She's very uh, focused. 
very, um, very focused. And very humble at the same time. Absolutely that. Uh, we had a great time hanging out with her, as brief as it was. I mean, literally, I think we spent about three minutes with her for the whole day. Uh, but we were constantly chasing each other around the, the paddock, trying to find ways to catch up. And I think we will throughout this year. But it was amazing to see her perform so well. And while she arguably is one of the hottest names in that series, uh, as the race proved, Alice Powell, Esme Hawley, Hawkey, Hawley, Hawkey, um, and a whole load of other competitors in there are seriously good, have accomplished many things in many different categories. And I think it will only improve as the season goes on. My question is, where is it leading us? Where is it taking us? Formula One, in a little bit of a higgledy-piggledy moment, if you ask me. Uh, we'll come on to that in a second. Um, but a lot of the drivers talk about how these days you don't need to be that physically fit to drive F1 cars. Of course, all the drivers are incredibly physically fit to mainly put up with the endurance and the heat and the G-forces. But compared to maybe 20 years ago, the cars are slightly easier to drive. And if you look at Max Verstappen's or maybe Lando Norris, who are young and kind of scrawny and, okay, fine, might be a million times fitter than me, they're not big stacked Lewis Hamilton's. Lewis has gone way too far. So therefore, why couldn't a woman enter Formula One if the physicality has now moved out of it? And that's not to say that some women aren't a lot stronger than men. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a weird one. Some people get very upset and defensive over it. Oh, women should not be involved in F1. But I think that is ridiculous. Um, I think a woman should be given a chance. I would maybe agree that potentially as of yet, there hasn't been a woman who could compete with the current crop of F1. You've got to remember, these are supposed to be 20 of the best drivers in the world. They aren't always that um, because of paid drivers, uh, but they're supposed to be that. So, you know, the woman is, you know, forget the fact that she's female has got to be of a standard. Uh, and I'm excited about the prospect of Jamie. I genuinely am really, really excited. I think there are other women creeping up in the ranks. Uh, let's not forget we've got Tat. Tatiana Calder, Tati, oh, I'm gonna, uh, anyway, competing in Formula 2 this year, fair enough, in a very uncompetitive car, but um, she is with, is she with Force India, not Force India, oh, that's awkward, Racing Point, anyway, she's she's with one, no, she's with Alfa Romeo Sauber, that's it, she's Alfa, Alfa Romeo Sauber, so she's got ins with the Formula 1 team, I think it's not going to be long before we see a woman in a Friday practice session, and good on them, but one criticism I'm going to make of W Series, um, maybe a little controversial, is there weren't enough women involved with the sport out of the actual cars? So I'm talking about mechanics. Okay, fine. There are a lot of women in the PR roles and managerial roles. Um, but actually, on a mechanic level, I was hoping or expecting to see a little bit more from a sort of female. And maybe that's because there just aren't female. Vicky's trying to get involved here. So. Yeah, uh, the, the weirdest thing for me was that you still get grid girls and that we no but i think i think no you i missed, think that's weird no i think that was carrera cup i think you got okay. that wrong i don't okay. think they had but it's grid. in the same it's on the same day i think i think yeah. we should have grid guys yeah they tried that in f1 once didn't go well, uh, well I, think, I think i think the only like you say the only women involved in the sport are the drivers the grid girls and the pr girls yeah so that was a bit strange that was that a little i think that's the only thing that maybe they need to address and if there aren't mechanics and engineers you know, of a good enough level, then train them up, start a sort of initiative or program, an apprenticeship, which helps elevate females in all roles in the sport, not just focusing on drivers. That was my one thing, but I, I'm not here to protect female rights or try and represent female rights. That was just my opinion, but good racing, exciting race. Um, and as I say, I'm just a massive Jamie Chadwick fan. So fingers crossed, I think Zolder is this coming weekend or next weekend uh, and fingers crossed she can continue her success because it is it is well due well deserved there we go not due well deserved uh, okay uh vicky's reminding me to pause and take it two seconds what should we should we chop it in two parts maybe because it's gonna get no no we're good we're good no no we're only we're not even at 30 minutes yet oh, okay. mm, yeah uh, whilst we were in Stuttgart, away from the racetrack, uh, I was mainly there having meetings. Um, so I was catching up with the AMG Mercedes guys. I've done a few bits with them uh, over the years, most recently the C63 launch, the facelift C63, uh, but not a lot else. And so I wanted to sort of touch base and say hi and see what was going on. Uh, they very kindly gave me a tour of the AMG factory. Uh, now, I had really underestimated just how hand-assembled 
uh, the AMG engines are. I know they have that whole like one man, one engine thing where you get the name plaque because theoretically one man or woman takes an engine from block to final sort of production version. Um, but yeah, it really is a sort of an incredible chain to see. Uh, but the one thing which didn't depress me, but I realised is that fundamentally most top line AMGs now all use the same engine, which makes sense when I think about it. But it feels a little bit like long gone are the days of real brutish aggro all out raw AMGs and now they're sort of within that Mercedes family they've just been ever so slightly compressed I don't know if that's right basically when we were in the performance studio which is where they work on customer cars but also their own fleet cars press fleets and just general fleet cars they had a CLK black series which had the naturally aspirated legit 6.3 liter engine so the actual 6.3 not a 5.8 5.5 that's called a 6.3 or whatever it is now Um, and they said that they're still using that engine in the race cars so that's how good that engine is slash was. And it's a shame now that that's been diluted ever so slightly and we've got bi turbos and stuff. It is just the way of the world. I'm not giving AMG that hard a time. Um, but it was a, I was a little bit upset. Uh, in a slightly more shocking move, uh, bless them. I mean, they were desperate to try and help me create some content whilst I was there. But it was just one of those days where I had so many meetings and so much going on. I wasn't that content focused. Uh, they hooked me up with a C... 43 cabriolet so a convertible c-class with the 43 amg i mean it's not really an amg is it i mean i don't i didn't this was mm, great car Vic, is that sarcasm? Uh, just FYI, let me introduce you to Vicky's sarcasm. Uh, it was not a car for us, and it just, as I say, didn't feel like an AMG. So I struggled a bit with that, um, but bless them, they they were incredibly nice to try and arrange something. And then we headed to the Porsche Museum. Oh my God, the Porsche Museum! If you are ever near Stuttgart, even if you don't like Porsches, go because it's the most amazing building architecturally, uh, but also just in terms of the exhibits. They change nearly every single day. There are about 600 Porsches that they have at their fingertips to put into the exhibition space at any one time. Um, And there are only about 80 cars on display. So they're constantly changing them around. And if you like stories around cars, go check out this place. I had no idea that back in the early 1900s, Professor, Professor Porsche... Professor Ferdinand Porsche, so not the young ferry Porsche that started Porsche as we know it, uh, invented really sort of one of the early electric cars, but it was all around uh, electric powertrains within the wheels and the actual wheel hub. So we all harken on about the Taken and uh, hybrid Panameras now. This guy was doing it back in the 1900s. So super cool stuff. I don't want to bang on about it too much because I know lots of people get bored about the Porsche content. We're going to try and bring up a couple of quick photos because it honestly was amazing. There's a lot to learn there. There's a lot to learn. And maybe we shouldn't give it all away. Um, It's definitely a to-do. I'm showing uh, those on YouTube. uh, The Pink Pig, the original Pink Pig race car. Uh, Also, me sat in a five... Thank you. <laughs> that's a little personal thing that's going on. Uh, sitting in a 550 Spider race car, a very uh, famous Panamericana one, and a Carrera GT, because if you didn't see the content from Monaco, uh, you may not realise that Paul Wallace made me make some kind of bet slash pact that I wouldn't make any Porsche-specific videos for the rest of Europe unless it was my own car or a Carrera GT. So uh, I took a picture of the Carrera GT just so I could get away with posting some stuff on Instagram. Um, But yeah, Porsche Museum, mind-blowing. And it was great to have a chat with the guys there um, and just sort of start planning and plotting some things for the future because I am, I've just become, you all know, I've become obsessed. Uh, And speaking of the future, let's kind of start to wrap things up slightly um, because... It's quarter to nine and the restaurant at the hotel closes at 9.30. So (laughs) we're going to need to eat. Uh, Where next? So from here, as I mentioned, uh, we go to Cars and Coffee tomorrow uh, before moving quite quickly through Croatia, stopping off on Zagreb for one night because, fingers crossed, I'm going to be headed over to Rimac. I've had zero experience of Rimac in general, the all-electric car maker and battery producer um they do so much more than make those concept cars that they're always uh, pushing around the place uh so hopefully gonna stop right there and then move on to bulgaria so for those of you that don't know vicky is bulgarian you probably guessed it by my accent but 
Well, no, I don't think anyone would have guessed it from the accent. But uh, but yeah, she's Bulgarian. And so we're actually using it as a kind of like uh, a sitting point or, or a pause moment within Europe. It's the point where we go from the south and turn around and head back north. If you remember, we started in the UK, headed south first, down through France towards Spain and Portugal. We'd be making our way sort of almost horizontally across Europe. And after Bulgaria, we start to head north. And we're there, we're, we're in Bulgaria for a couple of weeks because... I've got to pop back to the UK for a couple of days. I've got an exciting project with Shell. Uh, hopefully the first of many this year. You all know that I work with Shell a lot. Uh, and so this is quite an exciting project, which I'm going to be doing uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then also I'm going to be popping up to Berlin for the next Formula E race that I'm working out with Harman Kardon. Uh, more on that to come soon on the main channel. Uh, but I'm really enjoying this new challenge, this new partnership with Harman Kardon. And the second race that I'm attending with them to produce content for them will be the Berlin e Prix. So it's good to have a bit of a base during that period of time so I can fly in and out. Yeah, and like, like we said, we're, we're homeless during this trip. So, um, yeah, my parents have kindly offered to have us for two weeks and in the same way that Sam's parents kindly offered to have us in London for two days when we land. In <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's, it's just good to feel at home, even if it is for two days. I mean, it's a whole year of just changing constantly scenery, places, people, hotels. Living out of suitcases. I mean, we're going to do we're gonna do at the end uh, a wrap-up of how many beds we've slept in yep it's and, gonna be a few like yeah it's just it's just quite mind-blowing so it's good to to feel back to earth for a couple of days that's exactly it and get our clothes washed and have some home-cooked food and be able to make coffee when we want it rather than have to order it in a hotel i know this all sounds like luxuries and i'm sure lots of you are sitting there going oh i dream of the day being able to just order order coffees endlessly but there's just something nice about every now and again being able to make your own coffee when you want it and to be able to do things in your own time and your own way. And so, yes, a couple of weeks in Bulgaria will be ace for that. But that's not to say there isn't some awesome content lined up. I'm not taking time off. Uh, it's just a good base for us before, as I say, we head north through back through Germany, actually back through Hungary, uh, into some of the northeastern countries, Poland, uh, Estonia, Latvia, uh, into Scandinavia and we're trying to plot right now quite an epic driving route uh, through Scandinavia a bit like we did uh, across the Nullarbor in Australia we want to go super scenic so up through Finland across the top of uh, Sweden into Norway and then back towards Stockholm just to sort of do that in a four or five day period before finally making it back to the UK at the start of July for the sort of UK special so I'm spending about three, three and a half weeks in the UK in July, hopefully the best time to be in the UK for car culture and fingers crossed weather, but it is the UK. Um, get your jokes in now, people that don't live in Britain. Well, hey, um, so it will probably be raining the whole time, but the rain's been following us around Europe already, so it'll be no change there. Uh, and then at the end of July or the beginning of August, straight after my <clears throat> 30th birthday, uh, we are headed to America. Fingers crossed, with the 911 Carrera T. I say fingers crossed because right now, as we speak, Cars, my shipping partner, are processing all the paperwork for that. I mean, there shouldn't be any hiccups, but until everything gets signed off and America says, sure, bring it over, um, I'm always a tiny bit nervous. But yes, uh, that should mark the start, uh, August, of four months around America. And I, I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, it's overwhelming, it's daunting. Uh, trying to tackle North America, including Canada, it's just terrifying. There is so much to see, so much to do in such a short period of time. It's August until really the middle of October because the car has to get on a boat mid-October at the latest across to the Middle East so that we can have it in Dubai and Abu Dhabi for that section of the trip, which is uh, end of November. It takes about a month a month and a bit uh, to cross over so we you know as i say we have to finish on the east coast of america new york or miami mid-october so we're we're pressures on to fit it all in uh, i've accepted that we're not going to fit it all in we're just going to pick and choose and hope we pick the right places but we're excited i think it's a new challenge for both of us it's a lot more daunting than australia a lot more daunting than australia and I mean, much australia more daunting than like europe <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Australia. Honestly, we, drove, we drove through the whole country, and now looking at the US and Canada map, it's just, whoa. 
terrifying but we're gonna get there uh if you are listening and you are us based uh, and you have an idea for filming or a route we should take or a place we should visit this doesn't always have to be about cars i think especially in america we want to get back to exploring a little bit apologies that sort of travel vlog style videos have faded away a little bit in europe it's only because we're so familiar with this place i've made so much content in europe over the last three or four years and i'm sure i will continue to make content that i don't feel the need or the motivation or the time to do the sort of travel vloggy stuff as we did in Australia and Asia uh, but as soon as we hit America trust me that's going to be back I'm going to be trying pancakes in every state that we visit so yeah if you've got any ideas get in touch drive the world at seenthroughglass.com or slide into those DMs uh, on Instagram Twitter Facebook wherever you like uh, because we need those tips right now we are literally in the midst of planning and I hope to announce the route in a couple of weeks just before we leave Bulgaria for the sort of final stretch of Europe. But anyway, I think that's probably it. Um, as I mentioned, dinner is finishing soon at the hotel and we're hungry, we're gonna eat. And there is nowhere really around here apart from this hotel and this restaurant, so... Um... True that. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this kind of return, this soft return of Behind the Glass. Um, I always make these huge promises, we're back, it's gonna be weekly episodes, but this feels more manageable. Um, I hope you've sort of slightly enjoyed Vicky's inputs from the side. Apologies if the audio hasn't been quite up to its usual quality. This is a sort of initial trial run. Uh, for any of you frustrated on YouTube that you're still not seeing Vicky's face, I'm afraid you're going to have to get over it. We have zero plans for Vicky to ever appear on the channel, so uh, you're going to have to sort of slightly just, yeah, subdue those frustrations. Um, but, but hey, if you, if you come to one of the meets... Here she is. World, you can see me then. We have had some I weird comments. I don't wear a paper bag around there. Like no, she doesn't. And people, uh, for, for real, people enjoy meeting Vicky more than me these days. They come up and say odd things like, oh, finally we see more than just your knee. <laughs> uh, which is slightly uh, odd and uncomfortable. Uh, but no, it's, it's quite amazing, uh, the sort of fascination that has arisen around Vicky. But as I say, I hope you've enjoyed her producer role. It's definitely helped me out. Uh, so don't be mean if you haven't, because I need her. Uh, well, it, you can be mean, but oh. no one's going to care. Oh, there you go. Brutal. Uh, so there you go. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe for future episodes. And if you're listening, wherever you're listening, make sure to continue following uh, for more behind the glass chat and stories from the road. We'll catch up with you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.